All right. Welcome, everybody, to Finding Your Voice. And, you know, a lot of times when Virginia and I do these webinars, we have our fancy slides and we just kind of have the panelists um, so that you can see us. But we thought, you know, tonight we want this to be a dialogue. We want everybody to show their faces and share their voices and really come together as a community so that we really can connect on this very important topic. And, um, you know, Burjani came to me a few days ago and she said, you know, my daughter Amara is an activist and she has a lot to say about this topic. <laughs> and I, you know, would love to bring her in with my community. And I said, and my friend Shavara, She's incredible. I'd like to bring her. And so Virginia and I are really, we're taking a step back and we're bringing these powerful women forward this evening because they know a lot more than we do about this topic. And so we're going to start with Shavara Oren and I want to just introduce her formally. And then she's got to jump off and then we're going to have Amara take over and we're also going to be opening up for dialogue within. So Shavara Oren is um, an award-winning diversity and inclusion practitioner. She is a social entrepreneur, published author, a social justice activist, an independent filmmaker, and public speaker. She is a forward-thinking catalyst who is passionate about igniting organizational transformation. And in her current role as chief creative catalyst for collective concepts, she is best known for having conceived and co-created We Are Straight Allies, a national marketing campaign to support equality and move towards passage of inclusion policies to protect the LGBTQ community and white and woke. She'll tell you more about that. An initiative to raise awareness about racial inequality and promote quality equity through intentional action. So Shavara, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here tonight. And I'm gonna let you take the stage. Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, how are you? The bigger question is, is you know, we ask people, how are you doing? I think we take it a step further when we ask, how are you doing yourself? How are you doing yourself? Meaning, how are you practicing? How are you managing self-care? How are you navigating our world in this moment? So I just wanna pause for a moment to, to let you think about that. You don't have to respond, although actually I would love to have you respond in the chat box. How are you doing yourself? How are you doing yourself? Thank you for that, Jennifer. I am on edge. Yeah, I am on edge. Anyone else on edge? Great, fantastic, hurting. Thank you for that, Brad. Multiple emotions, tired, sad. Thank you for that. Worrying, thank you. Lorraine, thank you. Yeah, on edge is a great description. Overwhelmed, fed up, cautiously optimistic. Thank you for that. Yeah, Stephanie, oh, yeah, Elise, tired. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Peter. Hurting, yeah, disappointed. So there's some themes here, right? Um, thank you for that that um, introduction, Jennifer. One of the things I, I'd like to share and just to kind of tee up, con tee up context for this evening, um, I am a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner. I am all those other multiple things that, that Jennifer said. And, and I am also the daughter of civil rights and human rights activists. My mother is a white Jewish woman. When she was 23 years old, she was the lead organizer of the 100,000 person march on the Pentagon in opposition of the Vietnam War. That was 1967. A few years before that, she was a student at the University of Michigan and she led one of the very first anti-apartheid protests and actions on a college campus. They actually took over the vice president's office demanding divestment and divestment came to the University of Michigan's campus 20 years later in 1985. I'm the daughter of James Bevel one of the inner circle with Dr. King. My father was the architect of the 1963 Birmingham Children's Crusade. For some of you who may not be familiar, that was the effort where if you see images of children being 
attacked by vicious police dogs and water hoses pushing them down the street. That was the movement that ultimately led to the Civil Rights Act. President Kennedy saw those images and no one had really seen the images from the South. People hadn't seen images of lynchings. They hadn't seen images of attacks. And it was one of the first times and President Kennedy saw those images and, and said no more. My father was also the first to call for the march from Selma to Montgomery. Some of you might have seen the movie Selma. It came out a few years ago. I see some heads nodding, yeah. There's an actor in that film. His name is Common. He's a Grammy, Tony, Emmy, award-winning hip hop artist and actor. And he portrays my father in that, that film. So I guess you could say I was born into this work, although I only officially became a DEI practitioner just a few years ago. When I think about like this moment, responsibility, accountability, what does allyship and solidarity look like? Particularly for, and I'm, I'm scrolling through, so there are some people that don't have faces um, that I can't see, but I'm looking out primarily at a sea of white faces. And I imagine that in this moment, particularly for some of the responses that we saw in the chat, that this may be particularly heavy. Anyone struggling with what whiteness means in this moment? What does it mean to stand in solidarity? You can put it in the chat. Yeah. What does it mean to be a friend to a black person, a colleague to a black person, even perhaps a parent or a relative to a black person? Yeah, what about biracial people? So, so yeah, so that would be me, right? This white Jewish mother, this black father. I identify as a black woman. And I, I was on a chat yesterday um, with mixed race women who are leaders. And it's been a very, very long time since I've been in community with just a group of mixed race women, a wide range of mixed raceness, some black and white, some Latina and black, um, some Korean and black. And we were talking about, um, we were in a, a dyad and I had a partner and she physically looks white. And so she was talking about what it's like to identify as mixed race and black, but show up in this white body. So we were talking about our blackness and I said to her, I said, you know, my black, for as long as I can remember, my blackness is political. My mixed raceness is biological and historical. So thank you for that question about those of us who sit at the intersection of, of mixed raceness. I think it's an important, it's an important question, right? Um, how many of you are doing some, some deep interrogation of your beliefs, your understanding of systems, yeah, 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 thank you for that, Lori, 100%. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wanna share with you um, my experience and thinking about what it's like, and I don't know personally, right, because I identify as a black woman. My, I have proximity to whiteness, and so I wanna call out and own the privilege that I know I walk in with this skin, with this hair texture, with this level of education, with my socioeconomic status, with my able-bodiedness, with my straightness. I think it's important that when we are in community, we own the privilege that we have and recognize that it is very possible to be both privileged and disadvantaged simultaneously. Anyone else have that experience where you are privileged and disadvantaged simultaneously? Yeah, yeah, right? That might be an uncomfortable space because you're not quite sure where you claim privilege and where you claim, you know, I'm minoritized or marginalized. But in this moment, thinking about white people's responsibility and not just your own personal work, the interrogation of yourself, but, and I imagine, let me pause for a second. Many or most of you would say, I'm, I'm not racist. I don't do racist things, right? And I think as white people, I have a very good friend, she's, a, she's an elder, Bobby's in her 70s and, and she walks into rooms, she's a psychologist and she says, I'm a recovering racist, honey. And I'm from Alabama. And people, white people, they go, not me, I'm, I'm not recovering. Bobby says we all are, if we're honest about it because we're born into and we benefit from the system. And I kind of like that, she said, but she walks in, she's like, I, she owns it. I'm a recovering racist, right? And so think about that. And this isn't about judgment. This isn't putting a label on you. This is just recognizing that we are a part of these systems. 
you know, one of the things I think about in this space is I have always intimately loved a white person. My mother, my grandmother, my uncle Dale. Um, most black people in America couldn't say that, right? And not because I'm, I'm, I've got some higher level of evolution, it's just because America, <laughs> it's America, right? And so I share that because my mother and, and the people that I grew up with who were white people, who were around me, who were willing at any moment and even today, willing to lay down their white lives for my black liberation, gave me a certain perspective about the possibility of whiteness. Now, on the other hand, I have also seen the heinousness of, of whiteness. When I was a little girl, we, um, we moved to Memphis when I was five. And we first lived with some Black Panthers and the police came and surrounded the house one day. That's a, that's a whole other story. We have to do another session for that. But we left that Black Panther house and we moved to this little four room duplex. And I mentioned earlier that I sit at the intersection of multiple identities and we, we grew up in abject poverty, roaches in the refrigerator, um, food stamp lines, welfare workers. And so we lived in this little four room duplex and our next door neighbor, Mr. Jack would sit on his front porch he was probably in his late 60s, early 70s, had a big belly, seemed to always be wearing a plaid flannel shirt, had ruddy skin, sweat dripping down his forehead. He was bald. And he'd sit in this old rickety rocker and he'd point this double-barreled shotgun at me and my little sister as we walked to and from school. And he'd yell out racial epithets. I was six. My sister was four. And one particular, I guess, joyful Saturday, we had just come back from Girl Scouts and he had spray painted on the side of the house, nigger love and hunky. Now my mom's response to that was to get some borrowed white paint and we painted over it. You might think that the lesson in this story is about Mr. Jack on that porch with that double barreled shotgun, but that's not the lesson. The lesson is what our mother said to us. She, she pulled us in close and she said, you know, girls, Mr. Jack is sitting on that porch and he's, he's, mere, he's just mired in bigotry and racism. And, and that's his problem because until he fundamentally decides to change, until he interrogates self. And my little six-year-old mind just couldn't wrap my head around that concept because I'm thinking he's on that porch with that double barrel shotgun and if he pulls that trigger, it seems like it would be our problem. Right. And when I was about 12, what I realized she meant was, again, if we are not interrogating ourselves and willing to do the work, he could have killed us and nothing would have changed for him. His world wouldn't have been better because it was devoid of two little black girls, right? Nothing would have changed. So when I think about the responsibility of, of white people in this moment, um, the white and woke campaign that Jennifer mentioned I created it in 2016. It was right after the murder of Philando Castile, another black man that we saw in real time, shot to death with this baby girl in the back seat. And all of my white friends, I, I really, I think like all million of my white friends started calling me and texting me and emailing me. And they were saying, oh my gosh, that's the most horrible thing I've ever seen. Shavara, did you see that? And they were, the calls were coming in and I had to put my hand up and say, hold on, I, I can't handle my black grief and your white tears too, it's just too much. And I got very angry. And two days later, I took that breath, I did some, some self-interrogation. And what I was thinking is, if I want white folks to understand this, I'm gonna have to do a little bit more work. It's not my responsibility. The emotional labor is very challenging and not right and not fair. And I ended up creating white and woke, but I created it so that it would alleviate the burden of black folks to have to educate, right? To have to do the work. Back in the 1960s, anyone familiar with uh, the name Stokely Carmichael? Pan-Africanist, no, put it, write it down, look him up. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, Pan-Africanist, civil rights um, activist, he um, more radical. So he was out at the University of California, Berkeley. I don't know if they had checked out his bio before they brought him out there, but Stokely let him have it. Look up Stokely Carmichael, 1966, Berkeley. He's brilliant. I mean, this speech is brilliant. But there comes a point where he basically says to, to the white folks, you know, you need to do the work in your own communities. 
you, you don't need to be in black communities because the work needs to happen with you. The same year, that was 66, down in Atlanta, I mean, he's out on the West Coast, down in Atlanta, there's something called the Atlanta Project. Julian Bond, who was an elected official, civil rights icon, a brilliant black woman who's now a professor at the University of Florida, Zahara Simmons, they created this Atlanta Project and they, they basically, they said the exact same thing. They said, you know, if you want to do the work, you need to do the work where racism is most manifest in white communities. So with that kind of spirit in mind, the way we designed White and Woke, it was white folks doing the work. So there were trainers, facilitators, presenting eight hour training sessions, how to dismantle the racial hierarchy. And I was in Jacksonville, Florida at the time. I'm in South Florida now. And people said, you know, that, that sounds kind of radical. Maybe you should call it something else. I said, you know, I, not only am I not calling it something else, but I've already trademarked it. So, so this is it. But it was, it was white people in all kinds of spheres. Nancy Hogshead Maycar, who's a three-time gold medalist, Olympian swimmer and civil rights attorney. Hope McMath, a museum executive. A wide range of white people saying, you know, I'm going to do this work. I want to share another story with you, but I'm going to read you a, a quote first. It is obvious from the actions of citizens that they intend to control their own lives and communities, even if it means burning and taking what they think should be theirs. And if the same old structures rise again, they will be burned again. Several nights ago on television, a businessman from 7th Street said that his store was looted. Then he put steel doors on it and it was looted again. That shows the determination of the people to have what they consider to be rightfully theirs. Persons don't intentionally burn down what they own or find satisfactory, only that which they find intolerable. Written by Sue Oren, my mom, April 1968. Anyone think I was talking about this week? Let's let that, let's hold space for just a moment. She says, persons don't burn down, intentionally burn down what they find satisfactory or that which they own, only that which they find intolerable. Which really leads us into this conversation about riot or rebellion. Which one do you use? What are you hearing in your, or on your dinner tables, on your Zoom calls? Who's hearing riot? They're rioting in the chat, riot. Who's hearing riot? Looting. What else are you, yeah. Who's hearing riot? Protest. Yeah, riot, looting. Protest, revolution, yeah. You know, there is a distinction between the language of riot as random acts of violence and rebellion rooted in political response to historic oppression and structural injustice. Sit with that for a moment. Right? And challenge when you're in conversation, even in conversation with yourself, the language of riot, right? And the language of rebellion. And there's a very big difference. And the connotation for how we treat people, right? Based on what we think they're doing. I saw this morning, AP said 10,000 people had been arrested in protest in the past 10 days. How many people thought the protest would be over by now, that there'd be some kind of, uh, in the chat box. How many people thought, almost everybody, yeah. So let's unpack that for a moment. 400 years of oppression might have been solved in five days of riot, rebellion, protest. Something to think about, right? Something to think about. And I don't know, um, you know, as we're unpacking what's happening in this moment, I have a colleague, uh, Brittany J. Harris. We put together a, a series, a four-part series. We've sold out for the first one, but we'll probably continue this conversation. We were thinking about the work that my mother did. The statement that I read to you was after Dr. King was assassinated. And if you think 30 cities on fire is something, the week that Dr. King was assassinated, 110 cities were burning down. There were tanks in DuPont Circle. The National Guard, martial law, across the nation. My mom was in Washington, DC. She was 24 years old. And there was a 4 p.m. curfew. How many people have curfews in their cities right now? We're on a 9 p.m. curfew for seven days. Yeah, curfew. So there was a 4 p.m. curfew in Washington. 
and they were arresting black people by the hundreds. They ultimately arrested 8,000. My mom said, I could walk through DuPont Circle and the police didn't even look at me because her white skin shielded her. So she and a rabbi who's now 87, my mom's 77 this year, they organized 100 white people. Physicians went into the streets and picked up black bodies that had been shot and beaten. Attorneys stormed the jails demanding a lower of this thousand dollar bail for a curfew of 4 p.m. White mothers and nurses took in black babies and children because their parents had been lost. And then they issued a statement. They said, for 300 years, America has demanded that blacks be nonviolent, even if whites are violent. The greatest American who stood for that position was murdered Thursday night. Now it is time for white America to repay that historic debt, to be nonviolent, even if blacks are violent. But instead, President Johnson has sent tanks and helicopters. Troops are not yet strafing Washington, but the mass arrests have already begun. If anything is needed to show the bankruptcy of American racism, this is it. That the United States government is carrying on a military occupation of its very own capital. Sounds like this week, doesn't it? Yeah. They then listed eight pages of demands. They had food distribution. They were demanding that the quasi government allow black people to police themselves. They were demanding that grocery stores relinquish food and that the jails immediately release everyone that had, had broken the curfew. That's radical activism. That's risk, right? So the question, the question really is, one of the questions, one of the interrogations, what are you willing to risk? Let's see it in the chat. What are you willing to risk? Are you willing to risk something? COVID, contracting COVID, thank you, Deborah. Everything, time, everything, everything, everything. Friendships, family ships, arrest time, thank you for that, Tracy. Freedom, friends, judgment, Normal, thank you, Amber, Amber. Freedom, including your own family. Yeah, that happened to my mom. Her family wasn't too keen on her having a black baby. There was a disownment and a lot of other things that went along with that. St Sherry, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, Sherry, thank you. We're kin, thank you for that. Freedom, friends, family, time, judgment, misunderstanding. Yeah, thank you for that. And you know, it's not a rhetorical question because right now, we, we are at this pivotal moment. I think if there is going to be revolution, we're 10 days in. We've got an election coming up. We've got an occupant of the White House whose language is dominate them. We've got not rogue officers, we have a rogue intentional system, right? And so the question is, as a white person with white privilege in white America, founded on black and indigenous and Asian bodies, what are you willing to risk? And then what are you willing to do? Anyone been involved in anything thus far? And I mean anything. I mean, this isn't, a, this isn't like, you know, um, activism Olympics, conversations about your own whiteness, interrogating yourself, conversations with friends, making phone calls, being in protest. How many people feel paralyzed? Thank you for that. How many folks are feeling paralyzed and haven't been able to quite do anything? Thank you, Melissa. Conversations with friends, calling. Conversations, education, promoting and calling. Thank you for that. Started dialogues, scared to join protests. Thank you, for Maria. Organizing education conversations. I hope this is inspiring and also feeling like sense of community, inspiring that you see the actions that people are taking, but also honoring and owning if we're in a space where we, we're not quite sure what we should be doing. Nonstop conversations. Yeah. Yeah. How many people in, in corporate or, or nonprofit or higher educational spaces where conversations are happening and you're, you're leveraging your privilege to try to think about policy change? What does the hiring pipeline look like? Where are we recruiting? Right? Just some of the things outside of ourselves that when you think about 
Think about my mom saying, I could walk through DuPont Circle and my white skin protected me. Thousands of people being arrested around me. So it's like that, right, with white privilege. You can walk in spaces, you show up and you automatically get what? The benefit of the doubt, automatically, just by sheer whiteness. And I'm walking in and I'm thinking, are my earrings right? Is my necklace okay? Do, you know, do I have the right lighting? Because I don't walk in with credibility in spaces, in white spaces, necessarily. Again, honoring and, and recognizing I've got this proximity to whiteness. One of the things I, I did want to share, and, and Jennifer and I were talking about this, like a call to action. I care deeply about um, prison reform work. How do we dismantle, disrupt the prison industrial complex? What would it look like to um, decolonize, do work without the carceral state? I'm an, I'm an incest survivor and, and just recently was featured in a book called Love with Accountability, 40 voices of black um, folks, folks identifying as black, black identified folks with a wide range of experiences around childhood sexual violence, looking at it through the prism of restorative and transformative justice without the carceral state. What would it mean to end childhood sexual abuse humanely? Our, our, our book actually just won um, a Lambda Literary Award. There was an article in Vanity Fair just the other day. Really proud of that work. But what would it mean to do this justice work and if we really had peace officers and there was no need for police officers? I mean, could you imagine that? I mean, reimagining, like that's radical reimagination, right, of the systems we have. Think about the systems that are being disrupted right now that we didn't think we could live without. How many of you living in communities where they're releasing nonviolent offenders? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, some yeses. See people nodding, raising, yes, yes. Why were we incarcerating nonviolent offenders in the first place? That's the question, right? All of a sudden, we can provide broadband access for every child in America. Why were we charging for it in the first place? Right? People who are disabled, differently abled, have been asking for years, can you make some accommodations so I can work from home? We can't do that. Everyone's working from home. Why weren't we doing that in the first place? This is the type of inequality, inequity, right? I'm posing those questions, right? That's what you should be interrogating back in your workspaces. Do we really want to recreate these inequitable systems that no longer even serve us? We're going into our fourth month. What does it look like in six months when we've been homeschooling and Zoom calling and, right? So those, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just putting these out there kind of in the space, thinking about, you know, how are we interrogating? even interrogating what looks like positive action right now. How many people read that Bank of America gave a billion dollars over the next four years? Anyone read that article? It came out yesterday. One billion dollars, Bank of America, just committed over four years. And that's something that should be celebrated, right? I mean, that sounds like a big amount. And then you, you stop and you say, well, damn, it's taken a global pandemic and nationwide rebellions for financial institutions to seriously address inequalities perpetuated by systemic racism. And the financial services industry, banking in particular, if we look at just last year, 84% of the overdraft fees came from 9% of folks who had bank accounts and those bank accounts were $350 or less. So what does that $1 billion look like now? And I'm not saying we don't celebrate the beginning, but we lose sight of the system. How is it, right, that a, a billion dollar bank, multi-billion dollar bank can give 1 billion and still collect 11.68 billion in fees last year from the poorest of the poor in our, in our community. 
And I'm not saying we don't thank Bank of America for the billion, but then we push them and we say, so what now, right? And again, I'm just putting these out there because I want you to be thinking more critically about your role, about privilege, about what you read, what's actual. These incredible statements are coming out, right? Corporate statements. Nike released that powerful ad. They said for the first time, we're gonna say, just don't do it. Don't act as though racism doesn't exist. And it's got swelling music and it's stark, it's black and white. And then it ends. And it's call to action. And if you go to Google and you do a Google search and you type in Nike executive team, what do you think you see? Who's on Nike's exec? All white, every single one of them, right? So the ad is powerful. It makes a difference, but there's still this deeper level of accountability, right? And so I, I want to offer that we don't get so caught up in the headline that we're not further interrogating, for example, the disconnect between rhetoric and practice. The disconnect between rhetoric and practice. And that's even in our own lives. The disconnect between what we say to our black friends and what we do, right? What we say in this chat and what we do. Thank you for that, Amber. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna give some space, um, just, um, what are you thinking? What has, has this brought up anything for you? What's on your mind? What thoughts do you have? Did any of this resonate? How did it resonate? Thank you for that miracle, all of it. Does someone want to speak? Because I mean, I think it's important if there are voices, if people feel more comfortable speaking. Of different ways that we communicate, Jennifer. Thank you for no, that. Just type in, type in me if anybody wants to, to speak. I think it's important for people to speak tonight and hear your voice. So you can just type in me if you want to share something. All right, great, um, Deborah. I'm gonna unmute you first. All right, Deborah, go ahead and unmute yourself. Great. Hello. Hi. Hi. First of all, I just want to say thank you, Jennifer Shavara. Thank you so much. This was completely unexpected. I don't know how I ended up on the list, but I signed up and um, I, I honor this meeting for people to just be here wherever, you know, wherever they're at. I'm in Portland. Portland's interesting, just like all the major cities currently. And as I mentioned, my uh, kids are on the front line most nights here. And Shivar, I think you mentioned, did anyone think it was going to go on this long? I'm amazed. And I see the commitment by people here to, uh, it, it seems like it's growing every night instead of yeah. uh, reducing every night. They did the most amazing die in on the bridge. Uh, completely closed a bridge from end to end with people laying down for those nine minutes. And my son, who's 22, said he'd never been so moved by anything in his entire life. Um, so I was just so grateful that, um, that the people of Portland are coming out. And um, that being said, there's a lot that's going on. I think in all of the major cities, there's a lot going on that people don't know about and things that are happening have been removed from social media so that people at large can't see. And I think there's a lot of fear and intimidation going on, which saddens me. And here's my question, Shivara. Again, thank you so much for, you know, welcoming everybody. And I'm just now really learning what I don't know. <laughs> Probably not the only one, but I, you know, I can really say that. And I've invited other people into that space of, we don't know what we don't know. Let's, let's learn, you know, let's learn. Yeah. And let's support the people who support the people who support the people and on down, you know, there's a place for everybody. What do you, if you don't mind, if you have some thoughts you'd like to share, I would welcome your thoughts about how those of us who have enjoyed privilege for many of us who have enjoyed 
the the silent or invisible privilege that we just didn't even realize that I'm learning now. How can we use that to, you know, what what if you know, and if you would like to share some thoughts, and it's okay if you just want to point me in a direction too. But that's what's on my mind is how can I use the privilege I have to aid the people who do not have this privilege? What well, really can that. aid them for the longer run? Sure, sure. So I think that's a really important question. This goes back to what I posed earlier. What risk are you willing to take, right? Yes. And it's yes. a continuum because as you're learning that, wow, there's a whole other world I didn't know about. I'm, I'm learning about privilege. I'm thinking about white fragility, Robin DiAngelo's book, yes. reading Dr. Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. He just got yes. an amazing appointment mm -hmm. at Boston University. He posted about Fantastic. that today. Fantastic. There is an article um, that came out yesterday in Forbes, and it's, uh, Dear White People, here are 10 actions you can take to promote racial justice in the workplace, written by Dana Brownlee. She's a senior okay. writer. And I, I'm just gonna, um, I didn't know her, but I reached out to her yesterday. So we were in some conversation. I was talking to her about white and woke. I mean, number one on this list is get to know more people of color. Sure. It's, it's, it's real different saying I work with some black folks versus I went to my black colleagues home for dinner and I was in the bathroom and I saw this odd pink lotion bottle on the counter and I didn't know what that was and I asked them and they told me it was this hair grease and you know that's just a different level of conversation or I imagine some of you can see the wall behind behind, behind me so I in, an, in another life I used to own an art gallery but you see some images right so there's a little bit you know about me and as we are in each other's homes and there's something about privilege with that too. I, I just, I, I can't move further until I say, for those of us who are privileged to feel comfortable letting people in our homes, because if I was back in that four room duplex with roaches on the wall, you wouldn't be in my home. So be mindful too, you know, when we're on these calls and we're asking people to do Zoom and, and we're upset if someone's not showing themselves, there could be a wide range of reasons, right? But you see something about me and, and in this space, in this moment that we're in, when we think about Black people being afraid to be their full authentic selves, there might be a time or there is a time for Black people in your life who might be worried and say, oh, I, I better take that image of that Black person off the wall. I don't know how my white colleagues are going to respond to that. They might think I'm hmm. radical. Hmm. Right? I mean, so just something, something to think about. I like that she lists that as the first one. Um, she says, number two, call a friend of color this week to discuss the current state of protest. I will add a caveat to that. Most black folks are fatigued and exhausted. Oh, I can only imagine. Right? So if you call, and I think that I've, I've heard from probably 12 white people today from all, from my life in, in various segments, right? Reaching out, just saying, I'm holding space for you. I've been thinking about you. How are you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that how are you, most black folks are in a real bad place. So yeah. a better question might be, how can I best support you in this moment? Yeah, nice. How can I best support you in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. And that might just be, I mean, if you need to scream. Yeah. Right? It might just be, you may be so exhausted that you aren't cooking. Can I send Instacart to your house? Mm -hmm. Can I order something from a restaurant for you? Is there something that I can do to make your life a little bit easier? Because I know you've got the emotional exhaustion of having to show up on phone calls too and be smiling with lip gloss and earrings and around you people are dying. Are you speaking from experience? I'm speaking from experience. I can I, and there, can and I send an Instacart to you tonight, Shavara? Yeah. Oh my God. I would I know love it. Are, but I, oh my gosh. See that? Well, I'll stay started. afterwards. I'll stay okay. afterwards. I'll okay. figure out how to get okay. you an Instacart tonight. I, I mean, but, but I mean, you know, it's 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 those little. I mean, think about you know what this is like because this isn't just about the past ten days, or even the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. the Civil Rights movement. The you know, when we think about the physiological impact of racism and microaggressions on black bodies, there's data and research that shows our lives are cut short mm -hmm. because of microaggression and racism. That means I'm more likely to get kidney disease and heart disease and cancer. I also carry the generational trauma, racial trauma, right? I've got one set of great grandparents who immigrated in 1902 from Kiev, Ukraine and landed in, in New York and ultimately settled in Detroit. 
and my other set of great grandparents born on a cotton plantation in 1837 into, into enslavement and, and bondage. So the DNA of my, my black grandmother with all the horrors that she experienced run through my body, yeah. right? So I don't just have my own racial trauma. So it's just something, something to think about. I'll give you just one um, more. She talks about doing a diversity committee. These are more specific to, mm -hmm. to workplace strategies. There's another article out. It's actually on my LinkedIn. I posted it, I think a week ago. It's 75 actions and they keep adding more written mm -hmm. by a white woman. So I appreciate her perspective kind of owning, owning her whiteness, but that, thank you for that question. I think it's really important. Um, well, here's the thing I'm seeing. Here's the thing I'm seeing in Portland. Here's my concern is that I don't know. I'm not going to say this correctly. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing in advance. But I'm looking at all these people who I feel like are um, doing this sort of as a fad. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. they're getting all fired yeah. up. And w this is not going to end. <laughs> we don't even have any demands here. It, w w creating the change is going to take some blood and sweat. And, and I want to be one of the white people that, you know, yeah. put something real into it. As, <laughs> and... I'm doing a lot of the things that you said right now because I'm finally understanding, but I don't want to be one of those people who goes back to sleep. I think that's what I'm saying. I don't want to be one of those people who goes back no, to sleep. No, thank you for that. There's, there's actually a phrase for that, performative wokeness or performative ah, solidarity. Okay. Right? Okay, there's a definition, so, a label. There's, 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 it's, it's a thing. It's a real thing. It's a so, thing. Well, I don't want to be that it, thing. I don't want to be that thing. So performative wokeness and performative solidarity. And actually, you mentioned something earlier. You talked about the die-in. I said at the beginning of this call, yeah. our time together, that Portland, their bail fund had raised over $500,000. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right? I, I know those people. <laughs> right? Now, there is, and I would encourage you, to do a little research on performative wokeness or performative solidarity, there is some real conflict for many black people about white folks doing die-ins. Oh, interesting. Using, using interesting. a white body that would never, oh, ever, 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 right? Oh. Never, ever, ever suffer the same indignities that a black body would. So there's, there are a couple of think pieces that have come out just okay. in, and not just around this, but there have been some die-ins before when black people have been killed. So I'm not, I'm not commenting on it personally, one way or the I other. I am, just, I am just suggesting. I appreciate. I appreciate the perspective. Yeah. I I can say, however, that uh, awareness has been raised. Yeah. I can only speak for those who have spoken to me. Awareness was raised of what it's like to be in yeah. fear, yeah. and what nine minutes really feels like when you can't breathe. It feels like a lifetime. And right and. Yeah. And that's a profound experience. And I understand the other perspective as well. And, right. and I'm just offering that as yet another. I appreciate it. Oh, I so appreciate it. So this is would, what we need to learn. Yeah. So what I would encourage is like, if there's an idea, like I'm going to do this action or I'm going to have this conversation, this interrogation of, is there another perspective here? Mm -hmm. Might I be causing harm? Because intent isn't always congruent with impact right? Absolutely. Very, that's very profound. Thank you. Shavara. Right. And we thank have you. to own our impact. So I think that that, so thank you for that question. Any other no, questions? Brilliant. Some other questions? I think Josie. Oh, Josie. Yes. Josie, can you unmute yourself, honey? All right. Shavara, thank you so much. I'm so glad that I made the time to join this conversation tonight because, uh, in my little town of Wilton Manors, we're having a we're having a profound conversation, uh, you know. And 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 just recently, yesterday actually, we were, um, you know, the question was posed to the community: Why has there not been a protest in our community to stand in solidarity with the black community, right? And uh, this is a predominantly white male neighborhood, thirteen thousand person population. And, you know, the number came out, this 13% of, of the residents are, are Black. What you're speaking about tonight is completely, I mean, I lived in California for a while. I've been having these very intense, uh, conscious conversations for a long time. And it's, it's hard to translate that into um, just trying to kind of create peace. And yeah. I'm 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 at this this crossroads because I I'm doing my best to be almost a bridge, right? 
and I'm doing my best to be a bridge. What would you suggest being, because I understand both sides. I understand, I mean, I know I'm not black, but I am a person of color. I'm Puerto Rican, Italian, Filipino, lesbian. And I've, I've you know, I've had my own experience. And um, well, needless to say, I, I have lots of black friends, but it goes deeper than that. You know what I mean? And I understand, I always stand in solidarity with my black sisters and brothers. And um, right now it's really hard. It's very difficult to invite people into a space of cooperation, to openness, to solution, right? Yeah. What would you suggest as a way to really um, kind of start the conversation, to get on the same page, to, to really um, extend that olive branch so that we can move from the anger, right? The anger, anger protest to the solution protest, because now that we have the, we have, we see that there's some of us who are, you know, I proposed inviting the, the Wilton Manors Police Department to the protest and like, let's set an example for the rest of the cities that we can stand in solidarity and we can stand in unity. I understand the conversation is deeper, but my intention is to get to a solution. What do we want to see as a result of protest? Sure. And so what, what can you suggest uh, as a tool to help, help me facilitate these kind of conversations? Sure. No, thank you for that, Josie. So one thing, and I, I, this goes back to language, right, and how we show up. Um, you mentioned, um, if, I, if I heard you correctly, you were talking about, you know, now, you know, there are these anger protests. What do we do next? Well, first, we have to honor and recognize that we can't dictate when someone stops being angry. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And the session that my colleague and I, this, um, we're, it's a call for white humility in, res in response to black rage. Mm -hmm. Thinking about my mom and the work that they did, the white humility that they had to have. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe the number one step is allowing black people, we never get to rage. There's a wonderful article that I was, it wasn't even really an article, a guy on LinkedIn the other day, I didn't know him, but I know him now, we've been in conversation. And he wrote a piece about um, being a scared black man in corporate America. He's the only black man at his big investment firm in Atlanta. And I took it and I turned it into this really cool document. I put his photo in it, his logo, his company logo, and I'm using it in a big session for a corporate client tomorrow. And I sent it to him. He's like, wow, this is amazing. Um, I said, you wrote it, but he talks about the fear he has when he shuts his office door. Mm -hmm. He takes off his jacket, the fear he has walking down the street. And so I, I believe that the first thing we need to do is really hold space. Mm -hmm. Because whether it's a church in Charleston with a young man sitting for hours and then shooting up a congregation and, and those black people forgave him. And so the expectation is that black people are gonna, because we are forgiving people. We are. We forgave slave masters. We forgive bosses who don't give us promotions, right? And so there's this idea that black people need to get over it. And so for the first time, what I'm seeing in, in corporate spaces are black executives saying, I'm not okay. I'm angry. I'm enraged. Mm -hmm. Even the language we're seeing from some of the statements from corporate leaders is being driven by their black employees response. The CEO of Delta, he uses racism, hatred, and I think bigotry in his statement. Five years ago, that wouldn't have happened, You're right. right? Ben and Jerry's, of course, they had the most powerful yeah. statement. They, they, they called for, um, they have a call to end white supremacy in their statement. Mm. But they also have Justice Remix, the ice cream flavor that specifically mm -hmm. is out there so they can do prison reform. Right. They were the only statement that listed a four, a four prong platform for substance and change. They called out white supremacy in their corporate statement. Mm. So part of it is holding that space. Wilton Manors near Jack, um, near Fort Lauderdale, Wilton Manors. Yes. Okay. So, and you also, thank you for sharing your identities. What Josie was sharing with us is there's a thing. It's a thing too. There's a name for, there's a name for that. It's called intersectionality coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. 
in the, the 1990s. And she was talking about the intersection of our identities where we see deepening oppression, being Puerto Rican, being a lesbian, right? Mm -hmm. If you were disabled, low socioeconomic status. And one of the ways that you might think about engaging, particularly in Wilton Manners, is in one of the, when I give, I've, there, I've got three groups I wanna give you as a call to action tonight that you could go online and, and, and make a contribution to these three amazing organizations that are um, trying to get folks out on bail because we still have a cash bail system, which is one of the things that, that Ben and Jerry's is trying to eradicate, but it's the LGBTQ fund, lgbtqfund.org. And they are specifically raising money to ensure that folks from the LGBTQ plus community are getting bailed out. So to have a conversation around intersectionality, yeah. commonality is powerful and important. We have to be careful because we don't want to overemphasize commonality to the detriment of our, our uniqueness that makes us special and important, right? Mm -hmm. But in this moment, finding commonality, trying to have a conversation saying, you know what, let's talk to our queer black folk. Mm -hmm. because they are they are experiencing a heightened level of oppression mm -hmm. audrey lord talked about that right she said there is no hierarchy of oppression she's a black fierce poet writer she died um, some years ago of cancer but she says i am black and i am lesbian i am lesbian i am black mm -hmm. right so it might be really powerful to begin some dialogue talking about intersectionality and addressing how those multiple oppressions are impacting folks who find themselves in a black space and in a queer space. Mm. But you. first holding space and, and saying, if you need to rage, mm. what did I tell you, my mother? What was that statement? For 300 years, America has demanded that blacks be nonviolent, even if whites are violent. Yeah. Now it is time to repay that historic debt. Right. Right. So just drawing back to that lesson. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. Anyone else? Any other questions, thoughts? I'm going to take one more because I know, Shivar, you have to go. And I also want to put the links to every, all the different organizations. Um, I'll put them in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Hold on one second. There was also, I'm going to go back up here. Milagro, if you can unmute yourself, honey. Oh, hello. Yes. Okay, yes. Hello? Does everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear um, you. Yes, a uh, career teacher. Um, one of the most difficult things that I've in been encountering the last couple of days has been different Hispanic friends, and it's not all, it's some, like everything. And they're sending me certain things, and I can sense right off the bat, um, one of them was um, how many years... Um, George Floyd had been doing different things that were criminal and act. So then I asked her, I'm like, are you a Christian? She said, yes. So aren't we taught to forgive? Aren't we taught to um, look past what has happened? And then my question, next question was, can you explain to me? And that's my question is leading to this is how can I engage in conversations with my Hispanic community? I'm half Honduran, half white, American, European, and I know within that Hispanic culture, there's a lot of racism. Um, my former significant other, Black Panamanian singer, and he encountered it constantly. So what would be the opening question to engage in that conversation where I'm not met with this resistance or earlier today, somebody said, well, I just don't entertain with the drama. I ignore it. And I'm like, whoa, you know, you're ignoring something that is happening all over and yeah. it's not bothering you, but it's not affecting you, or is it just not sure what to do? I would prefer to hear, I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure how to break it down, but this is how I feel about it. This is my perspective on it. So it's just a, a place where I've been the last week, just angry, upset, outraged. Uh, as a school teacher, six months ago, one of my students was murdered. Not by a police officer, but, you know, somebody within his own community. So it's just all these different little things that are popping up. And sure. it's like, okay, take a break from Facebook. Let me take a break from this. But And self-care so, is important. Anyways. I mean, I thank you for that, Malaka. And I, I appreciate 
Um, Self-care matters, right? Um, so take a breath, take a pause. One of the things that you brought up, um, you, you were talking about um, your ex-partner, Panamanian, um, thinking about colorism, right? And how colorism shows up particularly in um, the Latinx community, Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. Again, that close, that proximity to whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I tend to do when I am troubled and bothered by someone who has such strong opposing positions is I get curious. I get mm -hmm. curious. An example of that is, is earlier yesterday, um, I was on someone else's LinkedIn making a comment. It's a black executive. And I made a comment and I was sharing about white and woke. And someone on the page got upset and accused me of um, using my white privilege to appropriate black culture. He thought that I was a member of the Aryan nation and that I was sending busloads of people to disrupt um, protesters and cause more harm in the black community. And I responded and I, I said, you know, woke certainly can be taken out of context. And I briefly explained that. And he was just railing in on me. And so I decided, and at the time I didn't know he was a he, he was hidden from me. Didn't know if this person was white or black, didn't know they're generational, mm -hmm. you know. So I go to this person's private message and I say, I am, I would welcome the opportunity to learn more about your perspective. And he went in, he said, well, I looked at your page and I thought you were a white woman with rouge. So immediately I knew he was at least of a certain demographic because when's the last time you heard the word rouge? I mean, that's something my grandmother used to say. Um, and what ended up happening in this conversation, I shared with him that I was a survivor of incest. He shared with me that his wife was a survivor of incest. He was a survivor of stranger danger. He thought he had Asperger's, but it was really PTSD. He then mm -hmm. said, when I get over myself and this awkward introduction, I'd like you to mentor me on how to do a TED Talk. Because at that point, he had gone to my LinkedIn and seen that I had done a TED Talk. I told him that we were all mm -hmm. learning together. And then he shared with me that he loves Gil Scott Heron, who is this amazing writer, poet. The revolution will not be televised. If you've never heard it, you should look it up tonight on YouTube. The revolution will not be televised. So here's this older white man. We share childhood sexual violence. He loves Gil Scott Heron, and I'm about to mentor him on how to give a TED Talk. And yesterday he said he thought I was a member of the Aryan Nation and a white woman with rouge. The only reason that even happened, and we have this relationship today, is because I got curious. And I, I encourage you to get curious without judgment. Be curious. One of the questions you could ask is, you know, again, thank you for that. You notice as you all were, I think, thank, you know, thank you for that perspective because it's a gift when people share, whether you like what they're hearing or not. Mm -hmm. And acknowledgement, acknowledgement isn't acceptance. So saying mm -hmm. thank you for sharing is simply acknowledgement. I heard you. Do you mind sharing more? I'm curious. Where did you get that perspective? This man went off on me yesterday and today, we're in dialogue and I, I think we're friends. And it only happened, now the emotional burden landed on me, right? I had to do more work, which I don't appreciate. I also just <laughs> in my soul realized that he was coming from a place, it didn't have anything to do with me, nothing. He didn't even know me, so how could it have anything to do with me, right? And I don't mean disassociate ourselves from what's happening in the mm -hmm. moment, but, but get curious with, with a little grace. And, and I think it's important, the last thing I'll, I'll say on that is holding grace and space for other people and ourselves. And I do wanna just go back briefly to what Josie said about bringing police in, back to that performative wokeness, because I think this could cause harm to the black community. I'm sure many of you have seen those images of police officers kneeling in solidarity. Mm -hmm. As people started doing a little more research, they started researching the individual officers and found out that this officer shot these five black people and this officer has these reports against them. And so if an officer is kneeling, but not willing to take the risk to dismantle a structure and a system, we've got to question, right, the performativeness of the moment. So I, I just want to offer that. Um, I am so thankful to, to be here. I will put my... Um, 
my, I'm, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, and Shabara, I'm going to send everybody all your information okay, and wonderful. The, wonderful. the amazing organizations that you're suggesting and oh, also definitely. more about your incredible documentary that you're creating. Yeah, that. yeah, I'll send you, yeah, and, and there's a, there's, you could certainly, I'm, I'm in the process of producing it now. We, we did some shooting in September. It's going to tell the story of my mom and those 100 white people, but it's also going to explore the more fundamental question about what is a white American's responsibility in this moment to be anti-racist outside of performative wokeness, outside of shame, outside of guilt. I, it was such an honor um, to be here in community with you tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing your space. And if anyone wants to continue this dialogue, I am accessible. Um, and I look forward to to this journey together. Thank, Thank you so much. much. So much. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Wait, wait. I want to send oh. you dinner. Oh, you're gonna send me dinner. Okay. <laughs> I am gonna you. send you dinner. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna send, send you I'm dinner, Shavara. You, I must put my cell in here, and you can text me. Okay, can, you got it. Okay, I'm putting it right there. Oh, you were so awful. Wait, where is it? Did you send you. it to me? I just sent. I just sent my. I just sent it in. My cell, I put my cell in the bro in the box. I'll get it to you, Deb. <laughs> okay, would you, Jennifer? That would be great. That'd be great. I'll text you right now and send you okay. dinner, Shavara. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bye bye. Take care. Be well. Be well. Right. Thank and you. So, be well. Thank now you. I'm going to turn it over to Virginie, and she has something very special in store for us, which is her daughter. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Hi. for being here again. And as you know, I always have so much to say, right? <laughs> like I have slides, I have all this information. I'm always speaking fast because I want to give you so much. Today, I want to share the most special, a wonderful thing in my entire life. Uh, I'm super proud of Amara. She's an intersectional feminist, social justice activist, outspoken and very opinionated. <laughs> That's her own bio. <laughs> <laughs> the person that is educating me every day about all these issues. Thanks to her, like she reviewed my email, she makes sure when I'm sending it right. She was the one that did all the research for the links that I send you guys by email. I mean, she's really my boss. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wanted to share her for the first time today. I'm extremely proud of her. So please welcome my beautiful daughter, Amara. Hi. Um, so yeah, this is my first webinar. Um, and so like when my mother said, my name is Amara Royer, uh, I'm 17 years old. And a lot of people are going to be, the first thing is like, why should I listen to a 17 year old? Like why, what's going on? It's mainly, I'm, I'm bringing in my own personal perspective growing up from my generation in the current America that we all kind of like are surrounded with ourselves. And I'm bringing in this topic of race mainly because I only have been in this, I've been in this conversation for about six years now, ever since I moved to the States, because when I was younger, I, it wasn't that I never, I didn't, experience racism is that we were so sheltered that we weren't very much aware of this global issue. We grew up in Aruba. We grew up in Aruba. So being kind of mixed race, Afro-Caribbean and Hispanic and like Dutch, and we're all just so, it's such a, like a, a melting pot per se that it's not this very, we're very different from each other. It wasn't until I moved to America and I started my sixth year, year here in Gulliver. I went to a private school for about two years. And because of the socioeconomic factor of it, I was mainly surrounded by white people. And it wasn't, we were reading, I remember very, very clearly, we were reading this one book called Anthem in class. And in this book, it was kind of discussing how, you know, everyone, did, there was no individuality, everyone was referred to as it. And so there was this class like activity where we had to be like, oh, the different one, um, the individual one is it, the creative one is it, the pretty one is it. And I remember really clearly um, this white girl, she was in front of me, she turned around and went, the different one is it to me. And this was my first like true experience being like called different because like I said earlier, I grew up, sorry, <laughs> I grew up in Aruba B and everyone, almost everyone looked like me. And so I wasn't very much aware of this like, oh, being different until I moved to the States and was kind of chucked into the system that I wasn't very much aware of until I lived here. And for the past six years, I've been exposing myself and just 
been exposed to these racial injustices, which I feel like a lot of us don't realize is occurring to us because it's kind of this thin veil that to protect us in a way. And in my, I remember clearly our education system has never taught me some of those topics that I had to do research on myself. A lot of like history, it's, you know what they say, history is written by the winners, you know, the colonizers, the white, white folks in this situation. And so a lot of it, while it may be the truth, it's also not the full 100% truth. I remember, I recall I was in my US history class and we were discussing um, black people migration and how a lot of people, and I remember the terminology, it was for economic, uh, Economic success, so economic reasons. Yeah, it was. It was for. It was for. They moved from the south to the north for economic reasons. For, you know, for better jobs, all these things. And then I was watching a documentary the other day, the Thirteen, and it discussed how history books. They just say, oh, it's for economic reasons, but they were escaping the terrors of the south because of the lynchings that were occurring. The way a lot of a lot of black people were just fearing for their lives. That's the reason why they escaped the south to go to the north. And that, like, it puts it in perspective how we are given these, like, very common words. Economic reasons. Like, it's, they just moved for that reason. But the reality is, it was more than that. Um, the name of the documentary was The 13. So It's amazing. I just watch it and cry <laughs> for two hours. Yeah. It's just, like, really eye-opening. And so I was kind of, like, it put also in perspective how, Growing up, we watch teen, like kids, we watch so many different shows, we watch so many different like programs, and I never paid attention to the fact a lot of the people who were in the shows that I was watching never looked like me. Like this wasn't a conversation that I was like having as a young kid up until I moved here and I realized there weren't that many shows with people that looked like me, had my skin color. And I'm I'm light skinned, so you know, you'd expect there to be a little bit something there, but not even in that case. There was very, very few shows. I can only recall like The Proud Family being a show surrounding, you know, Black people in an African-American household. And this wasn't, I was just not aware of this factor. And when I was, um, I remember a few days ago with everything currently going on, Nickelodeon, a show, you know, it's marketed towards kids. They had a commercial, a nine minute commercial and it was a silent commercial and the whole purpose was kind of to show kids oh what's currently going on and i remember the outrage there was parents being like oh why should i show my kids this why should i show my kids this why should i um expose them to the injustices it's so someone who was like me in sixth grade wouldn't be called the different one because it's not like these kids are purposefully trying to be racist it's that they were never taught how not to be racist because they grew up in an ignorant household and because they were so sheltered like I was in Aruba, they weren't ever kind of exposed to this reality. And so I'm not saying to show your kids like videos of police brutality. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying it's okay to open up a discussion of race in America as a child, you know, because a lot of my friends themselves, their parents personally, they have raci like racist parents, they have racist grandparents, racist family members, and up until they were like 14, 15, when they, they started to formulate their own ideals, they didn't realize why it was wrong. Because racism is, you're not born racist, you're taught racism, you're taught these things, and it isn't until you're old enough to formulate these ideals that you can't kind of make up your own opinion on it. And like I was saying, I'm giving my perspective from my generation, growing up as a Gen Z, growing up in the age of social media, everything you see is like right in front of your eyes. Every, I grew up everything right in front of my eyes because I grew up with social media, meaning every single resource that I would want, I, have, I went and I looked for it because I'm given these resources as someone who grew up, you know, we're the first generation that grew up on social media. And that's why I feel like, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, it's not something that started with the George Floyd case. It's been something that's been going on for years and years and years. But the fact that we see it to this extent, the fact that everywhere we look, we're seeing these posts, these informative posts about protests, we're seeing the rebellion posts, we're seeing Black Lives Matter everywhere we look, it's because we are finally growing up and, we're, and we see it right in front of our eyes 
the reality of the situation and a lot of people are questioning everything that they grew up learning. A lot of us were spoon fed these ideals and that's okay because we are in an age where we're realizing it's okay to, to change your ideas. That it's okay that once you are given a different perspective to change your ideas and we are opening up this conversation that we have been opening up for years but we're finally like all opening up truly our eyes to the reality of the situation because we have it on our phones right in front of us. And so I kind of wanted to like focus upon, <laughs> focus upon the fact that it is okay to be exposed to all of these things and to change your ideals. It's okay that once you are given these facts to change the perspective of what you thought you knew, because a lot of, like I said, I, grew up very ignorant it wasn't a bad thing it wasn't a bad thing at all but once you know i was taught and i was shown case this reality the system of america and like i said also earlier it's a global issue it's like it helped me shift my own personal perspective on the situation and it allowed me to give a new opinion on this aspect um uh, Shivara earlier was talking about kind of this performative act, like this performative activism that I have seen a lot recently. And I wanted to talk a lot about that because my mom said a lot of you guys are business owners and you guys are probably wondering how to navigate in this new kind of social media aspects where you guys are probably very concerned about what to say and how to avoid saying the, the wrong thing, how you guys just want to make sure that everything you're saying is genuine. Yeah, like I have to ask her every time I posted something on social media because, you know, I'm not educated enough to know if I'm saying the right thing. I really want to give my support and show up as a business owner, as a leader and support my community, but I don't have the right words because I sometimes don't know. And so she's the one that managed my social media right now and tell me exactly what to do. So I was like, can you share this with everybody? Because we have yeah. a lot of business owners that would like to know how to use social media right now at home and make a difference just from your phone. It's a good way because I don't know if you guys remember Blackout Tuesday. That was two days ago, Blackout Tuesday. And your Instagram feed probably looked like mine, which was just a bunch of black pictures consistently. And it would just, I had just the hashtag Blackout Tuesday. And the, the purpose of the whole movement originally started, a lot of people don't know this, but it started by white supremacists. And but it was, it was shifted, it was shifted into a more of an empowering movement because people were using this hashtag into educating others instead of posting this black photo. However, if you click on the, on the hashtag Blackout Tuesday, there are currently right now 23 million posts, right? 23 million people claiming, oh, I'm for Black Lives Matter, I'm for this, I'm for that. And then the George Floyd petition only has 11 million signed signatures. And so, that's a great example of how you can see people aren't putting their money where their mouth is. People are saying, hey, I'm for you guys, and then sit at home, they don't do anything, when your entire Instagram feed is probably filled with petitions and donation links. So performative activism is, is harmful. It's truly harmful because you are, you are trying to be like, I'm with you guys, I care. And then you can see that the people don't care. And for someone to, fake an empathy, an empathy aspect like that, it kind of makes you feel invalidated because it's like, oh, why would you go so far the distance to fake your empathy when you could have very easily signed the petitions, sent some donations, just helped yourself. And kind of, I went to, I have some, I have so many links, but I like, I didn't want to overwhelm you guys with the amount of links that I have. Um, so I like, I think they're going to send an email later. With yeah, we're going to send an email tomorrow with all the amazing so, information. So it's just, a few and links. it's just a few donation links. It's just um, different series, series you can watch on Netflix and documentaries because it's very important in this time and age to educate yourself and to also share what you, the knowledge that you learned. Because even if, let's say you have a small platform, or you feel like your voice isn't loud enough, even if it impacts one person, that one person can go and do the same to two other people. And then those two other people can go to two other people and it continues on. And it's just this butterfly effect of helping others because even if you feel like your voice isn't loud enough, 
it's loud enough because it's going to impact people no matter how you approach it. And so this is like an important aspect because a lot of people are sitting at home right now, like, and they're trying to figure out how can I help in this aspect. I personally, I haven't been able to go to the streets like a lot of my friends have. I, I, I don't let her. <laughs> I have, if it were up to me, <laughs> I mean, I, of course, as a mother, I really support her being an activist, but obviously as a mother, I'm super scared something may happen to her, obviously. So <laughs> I was like, you can be all the activists you want and like support you from anything from home. <laughs> so I had to figure out a way, how to use my voice and my platform as a teenager in America into speaking out about this without, ha without being able to go to the streets like a lot of my friends were. And I realized social media is such a powerful tool. It's such a powerful tool because I have, so I use multiple different social media apps, like outlets and I get most of my immediate news from Twitter, for example, because these are a lot of people who are sharing real time situations. But a lot of my friends and family on Instagram don't have Twitter. So I've been taking information from Twitter and posting it on my Instagram. And I've been getting DMs being like, I don't have a Twitter, but like your story has been the most like informative for me. And that little aspect has been, you know, I've been, been able to share multi to multiple people and giving my perspective and giving my facts and my sources and my resources to people from sitting by sitting in my bedroom. Yeah, it's like curating information, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when I say sometimes you feel like I have nothing to say. Yeah. And I, I feel like a lot, but then I curate information that I think is relevant. So I push it to the, like she say, only if you have 10 people in your Instagram, 20 people on Facebook, five people here. Those are five people that now have the knowledge of something that you share and you're making a difference. So that's when we're trying to find our voice that's our voice. Our voice matter. No matter if you're speaking to one person, I just want you to stand in your power and see like, yes, I'm going to make a difference. And like she say, let's not pretend because nowadays can everybody tell. can smell it, right? You everybody can, can see like, really? You're putting and up people aren't afraid to call you out. Yeah. So it. like you put a black square, that's it. Show me. And you've been silent the entire week. And it's you're very silent. Yeah. So what is it you couldn't do? Like, tell me what is it you're going to do? So let's just get out there and mm -hmm. be a force for good. We are in a historical moment and we all are participating here. So each of our voice is important, mm -hmm. each of us. So what I, another aspect is like, a lot of people they're like, oh, I don't like politics. I don't like this. I'm gonna stay neutral in this situation. And neutral, neutrality in this situation is violent in itself because the second you are neutral in a situation that involves human lives, immediately you are on the side of the oppressors. Even if you're like, I'm personally, I'm not racist. Personally, I'm just gonna stay neutral. I'm gonna stay out of this. I'm gonna stay out of politics, but this isn't a, polit a political issue whatsoever. This isn't a political issue. This is a social issue. This is an issue involving human people's lives. And the second that you're like, I'm gonna step a, I'm gonna step out of it. You're stepping into an oppressor and your your neutrality is political the moment you decide that it's not. And this is an aspect a lot of people have been very, very silent on social media because they're afraid, they're uncomfortable. But the thing is, it's in this situation is uncomfortable and it's okay. The fact is you gotta tackle that uncomfortability uncomfort and you gotta just push forward. For me, posting on my Instagram story was very, at the first, was very uncomfortable because my mom knows I never post on my Instagram story. You'll get like a half of a selfie like every five months on my Instagram story. But in the past, you know, week and a half, I, I've posted around 700 posts on my story consistently because I had to battle through that uncomfortability that I need, that fear of like this audience that I have. And I had to battle it because I knew it was for the greater good. So Facebook, so she never, oh my used, God. <laughs> she never used Facebook because that's where the family is. The last time I used Facebook was eight years ago. <laughs> and uh, she went back into Facebook. I wrote so an you essay. Can, like, she wrote an essay. She put it on Facebook. She's I had a family. She's calling her grandma like I mean. <laughs> I redownloaded Facebook. That's how you know this is a serious issue. If I have to redownload my Facebook after seven years. <laughs> and I, because I was just like a lot of, I know a lot of people who are relying so heavily heavily on our news media but as we all probably know by now the media never tells you the full truth the media will always show you the negatives of the positive situation and that is something that I wanted to avoid I wanted to give the full 100% based on my personal experience my friends personal experience different eyewitness accounts on the entire truth because the media is going to show you looting 
uh, criminals, as Trump said, thugs, all of these things. But at the end of the day, they won't show you the peaceful protests. They won't show you how people are trying to donate. They won't show you the amount of activism happening outside of this very, like these minute, like isolated in situations. And that is why I was like, I was like, I need to like, I need to talk about this. I mean, like, I was like restless for the past 24 hours. My mom knows I've been 24 seven. I've been just like, I need to talk about this. I can't stay silent yeah, about the situation. I go to sleep at three in the morning and I wake up and I look at her story. So it's like, oh my gosh, did you ever sleep child? Like three? I'm like up until like three. I was just like, I gotta like post information because I have um, a following from all over America and globally as well, because I have, I, I connect very easily to people from all over the world. And I'm just like, I need to speak about this because this is, like I said earlier, this is not an American issue. Well, a lot of it is focused on America. It is a global issue. This, the system is a global issue that we all need to be talking about. <laughs> and the thing is a lot of, because that's a main reason why some people aren't speaking because they're like, this is an American issue. I'm not American. I don't have to talk about this, but it's globally, it's globally. Everyone needs to be talking about this. And that's why silence in this situation is dangerous because if you aren't talking about it, who's gonna be talking about it? Because you need to bring up the conversation if, where you are from and you need to bring up the conversation if no one else is bringing it up. Because I know people- hmm? I, I, wanna, I wanna speak to something that you're, you're talking about. A lot of people on here are my students and we talk in spirituality about staying neutral. And I wanna make a distinction, and I love what you brought up. And by the way, while I'm talking, they all wanna follow you on IG and Twitter, so please put it in there. Um, what I wanna say is that there's a distinction of being neutral, being an observer, and then being silent, right? And, and in the spiritual community, it's like, I'm neutral, right? And that, you are 100% right. That does absolutely nothing for change, right? It's, it's great if you're triggered and you can step back and look at a situation with neutrality first and then take action. So there is reaction versus inspired action. And a lot of us confuse that neutral conversation, right? Neutral conversation coming from neutrality actually means starting from ground zero you know, and getting yourself balanced and grounded and centered and really coming from a space of being a responder versus a reactor. And a lot of people confuse that. I'm neutral. I'm Switzerland. I'm not going to take <laughs> sides. But really in the spiritual community, neutral is I'm going to neutralize myself. I'm going to step back and be an observer first I'm going to gather the information. I'm going to ground and center myself. And then from that space, I'm going to speak up. I'm going to take inspired action. I'm going to stand for what I believe in, but I'm not going to come from a place of hate and judgment. I'm going to come from a space of objective observation, of passion, of inspired action. And so within us we have to be really clear about what neutral really means and i'm so glad that you brought that up because we think we're being spiritual if we think we're being neutral but that's really not what it means it's about neutralizing yourself so that you can step up and be powerful and make change yeah a lot of people Guys, it is 9 30. I just want to know, Amara, what last words of wisdom you have for everybody. And I think you have completely blown for Jenny and I community away. We're going to have you back. This is your <laughs> first, but not your last webinar. Oh. And just, um, any last words in closing I mean, that you want to say tonight to everybody? A question. I'm more than willing to answer questions because, well, like I said earlier, I'm, I may be only 17, but I've been on this topic for the last six years. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> I've been very much informing myself and those around me on this topic as well. Yeah. So, well, we'll take a couple of questions and then I'm also going to, in our, in our email, I'll give you Amara's, um, all of her information and anything else that you want to share. And if they want to keep the dialogue going, um, 
But is there any questions that you guys want to ask now? I know people are mindful of the time, but Melissa, yay, has a question. Melissa, if you could unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, Amara. You are such an inspiration. Thank you for all of your amazing energy and how positive you are in, this, in these very challenging times. I've been very inspired by the youth and the activism that I see in the youth. When, I'm, when we were out protesting on Saturday, it was just such a young and diverse audience. And also what I'm seeing you know, across the country, it's, a, it's driven by the youth. And I, just, I, I, I would wonder what any words of advice that you have, how we can be more youthful in our activism. Because I feel as though the youth are approaching it from, um, there's, we can't turn back now. Um, they're willing to risk everything, um, and and if you can give us kind of some some understanding of how we can be more youthful in that approach. I feel like the way that we handle all of our situations is very loud. We're very loud about our opinions. We're very loud because we are given social media where we can be loud. We're given a platform where we're allowed to be loud. And the way that people can be more youthful in the way that their activism is being loud about their opinions and we use a lot of we are we use a lot of like sources and we do a lot of research and we do just we make an effort into educating ourselves before we we voice an opinion very loudly on our social platform because it's very look looked down upon if you make an opinion and then you don't have the facts to back it up that's like something that we ourselves know so all of our opinions we always have oh this is my opinion and people are like what are your sources well here are 10. <laughs> so yes. and, so and also in history we're always taught oh history repeats itself history repeats itself history repeats itself and we are immediately thinking what would happen if history truly does repeat itself and history is repeating itself now and so we are using this like background from our education and pushing forward as to how we can approach it better and so what you guys can do is you guys can be very loud in your opinion because a lot of the youths, they do not care. They will be very loud and in your face about the, their belief system. And you can be like that too. Even if it's to someone you know in real life or if it's on your social media platform, be like, this is my opinion. Here's some facts. Would you like a video too? Like I was, I was ready to prepare a PowerPoint for this. I was just like, you guys, like, <laughs> you guys want to see? <laughs> yeah, she's definitely my daughter. She wanted PowerPoints like <laughs> I do all the time. But yeah, it's completely true. One of the things is like, um, being polarizing. Remember when I, we talk about in business how to be polarizing so you can really attract the people that like is in alignment with your values in your business because those are the clients you want to have. Here's exactly the same. Like you have your own opinion and as long as it's backed up by facts, you get to be loud in those opinions. And I know for us, it's uncomfortable. Like I truly feel very uncomfortable right now to tell you the truth, like voicing for the first time. Like I was <laughs> never political. I was never about taking ever and now is the first time because obviously I am inspired by her, but because I know what is happening is completely different that I go through that discomfort mm -hmm. and I feel it and I push through. And as long as I is backed by, like she say, a fact, I am not okay. Because I'm, what I'm saying is not only my opinion, it's my opinion based on facts. Mm -hmm. So that's something definitely yeah. like, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions, guys? I think there was one other one that somebody put in. Hold on, Lord. Claire C. Please create a podcast. My mom's been wanting me to create a podcast for the longest yes, time. Yes, I asked you to, to start a podcast. Like, I'm going to push her. This, well, everybody's this. saying we want you to come back again. Oh, Claire says, how do you confront performative activists? So the way that you can confront performative activism, I know a lot of people are like, oh, um, a, a social lynching, show everyone that they're performative activism. My approach in that situation isn't to go about that, is to go to this person directly, being like, and if you're very much aware of the fact that this person has been silent, and then they posted that black box thing, and they continue being silent about the situation, is not to be like, hey, why are you doing this? But to send them links to petitions, send them links to donations, send them the links that they need in order to educate themselves, the resources, in order for them to be able to put their money where their mouth is. Is that clear? If you want to be an activist, even if it's performative, here, be a true activist and sign these petitions and links. Oh, open up your wallet and send donation <laughs> money. Like, 
it's you don't have to be like oh why are you such a performer of activism you have because then it shifts the situation onto from what it's we're actually dealing with onto the situation between you two and you don't want to do that because then you're making it about yourself you need to send them resources educate not just educate them but just make sure be like hey listen i haven't seen you talking about this this week i just want to make sure that you're signing the petitions here are some links yeah that's like, great yeah i just Excuse me, Jenny. I know you wanted to start a podcast, but apparently they're much more interested in your daughter. So you have like people saying that they're going to follow your podcast. So I also think, you know, I would really like to promote you having a podcast tomorrow and bringing on, I think what's coming to me in this conversation, and I know that I'm not alone. I know there's a lot of parents that are in our tribe that really want to know how do we talk to our children? How do we get our kids in that conversation? And they, they don't want to listen to Virginia and I, they want to hear themselves a the mirror. And so I think it would be really great for us to support you, Amara, in creating a podcast <laughs> and, and bringing on youth, like let's bring on youth to, to be on this podcast. And of course, Josie, we're gonna also have you on the, the, the next mayor of Wilton Manors as one of her guests. But I think that we should do that because you know one of the questions here, Amara, is like, how do we talk to this? How do we talk to our children? And I'd love to hear your take on it, but I think the way that we talk to our children is just to send them to Amara because they don't want to hear it from us. They're going to roll their eyes. Their books. Their but, but what would you say? I mean, joking aside, what would you say, Amara, to the parents out there? What is What are some of the ways that you can get your kids engaged and have this dialogue with them? I feel like if you go about it by age, for example, the younger crowd, like eight and under, there are so many books that you can start bringing up into the conversation and so many book movies as well that they speak about race, but not from a place where it's like loud in your face and filled with hatred, but they speak about race that in a very honest way. And if, for example, you, you're white, your kid's white, it's very, very, very important for them to notice, hey, listen, there's nothing wrong with that, but you have this privilege that just because your skin color is different to others, just because you have this kind of shield around you because you don't look at the police the same way brown and black kids do, doesn't mean you can ignore this issue. And to bring up, it's harder to bring up this topic because a lot of parents, they try to ignore this for as long as possible because it's very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable for themselves to talk about it. It's very uncomfortable to talk about your kids to your kids too. But it's okay to bring up these conversations, especially in the way that America is today because we're, they're gonna grow up into this and they can either, there's two very different directions they can grow up with. They can grow up and like do what I am doing. And it's like activism, yeah, I'm loud. And then there are some people that I go to school with that grew up in the very opposite direction. And because, and they're given a darker side of the internet and then they end up growing into their own racism, racist like traits and stuff. And so as a parent, I feel like it's very important for your child to be, aware of what's happening today why it's what's happening whether it's positive or negative on your end and to show them media because kids like they love movies we love movies we love books we love movies we love media and it's very important to intricate like to grab these media forms and kind of intricate them into your everyday life so it's like when you're seeking cauliflower and your mac and cheese, it's kind of like that situation where instead of you're like, here, eat your veggies, it's like, let me sneak your veggies in. So sneak this information in so your child grows up and kind of is much more aware because it's, it's going to be in the back of their heads. Like when they face it for the first time in their lives, it's going to be in the back of their heads already. Like I know there's so many um, mothers out there that are growing, raising their sons to be like feminist and such like that. It's the same like that with race, that it's intersectional in this situation. And that's very important to have. And if your kids are older and they're very, they're already like build up their own opinions, it's very, very important to challenge them in their opinions. Like if they're already in their late teen hoods, challenge them on their opinions. Be like, give me your sources on your facts. Give me, give me where you got this information. Give me all these things. And then bring up your own information, your own sources into the conversation because it's very, it's okay to disagree with your kid and it's okay for your kid to disagree with you. But if it's in a conversation that's life or death, it's very much your job to steer them into the right direction. 
immensely in that respect as a map. And it would be great in your resources if you could do, because I know you're so great with all the movies and the books, and if you could do it, it's already done. The resource, I don't know where you get all these, the, the resource from, but Jenny gives me 20 resources. So I'm like, oh my God, you're just like your mother. I love it. I have a 28 page Google slide. And I told her, please don't, and I told her, don't overwhelm them. She had 20 times longer than that. I was like, they already overwhelmed with so much information. Just give them the ones that you know is like that one. I love yeah. it. Well, I would love, I'd love to do this again <laughs> and invite, and it, I'd like to do this again. And I would like to invite you back, but it for the kids and us do a webinar that we invite all of our kids to attend, mm -hmm. right? Yes, everybody likes this idea. I have some friends on here too, so. Yay, Amara's friends. Yeah. So I think this is just the very beginning of just so much incredible community that we can come together, bring our kids into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's have an open forum for teens. I think that would be really powerful. And of course the younger ones can come too, but, um, I would like to help facilitate having that happen, Amara. And I am so grateful that you've been here tonight and you're such a leader. And Shavara was freaking mind blowing. And I, I don't think any of us expected tonight. Like tonight was, I think one of the best, best evenings, events I've ever had in my entire career. And I really didn't say anything. So there, there it is. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. And we'll have Thank more. You. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Tomorrow you. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, I'll send all the resources because Shavara is going to get it to me by late tonight. And then Amara is going to get me all her stuff. And, and I'll have Jessica, my assistant, send it out first thing in the morning. Love to you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good job, Bye, girl. Incredible. Nice you, Thank you. Incredible.